Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Nixon Library. My name is Jim Byron and I am the President and CEO of the Richard Nixon Foundation and I want to welcome you to a... Thank you. I want to welcome you to a very special presentation in which four Americans who were captured and imprisoned as prisoners of war in North Vietnam share with you their reflections on resilience, fortitude, and faith and what that means to them. I want to begin by welcoming some special guests. The great former two-term governor of the state of California, two-term senator representing California, and a member of the board of directors of the Richard Nixon Foundation, the Honorable Pete Wilson. Thank you for being here, sir. And First Lady Gail Wilson, thank you for being here as well. I want to welcome Sandy Quinn, a member of the Richard Nixon Foundation Board of Directors and former Foundation President. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Kaylee Mason, curator of the Perot Family Collections in Dallas, and she has been spearheading the partnership with the Nixon Foundation, which has been terrific. Thank you, Kaylee, for all of your support. It was hard to miss that there are a number of veterans, and particularly a number of Vietnam veterans that are here in the audience. If you're a veteran, I will ask you now to stand and let us show you our appreciation. I also want to welcome Frank Zhao and Tam Wen and Derek Wen and other community leaders in Little Saigon and, and Garden Grove. Many of you have had relationships with the Nixon Library and Foundation that go back uh, longer than my own. And I know that the uh, topics that we're going to discuss today are deeply personal to many in this room, so I'm thrilled to welcome you all this morning. And thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to welcome Hugh Wen, the Orange County Clerk Recorder. Where is Hugh? There he is. And city officials from Westminster, Mayor Chi Charlie Wen and Councilwoman Amy Fan West. And of course, from our home city of Yorba Linda, Mayor Jean Hernandez. Thank you for being here, Mr. Mayor. I'd also like to acknowledge the major sponsors and supporters of this 50th anniversary homecoming celebration to honor our Vietnam POWs. And those major supporters include the Air Power Foundation, American Airlines, the Gary Sinise Foundation, In-N-Out Burger, Sarah and Ross Perot Jr. in honor of Ross Perot Sr. and Ling and Charlie Zhang. And there are many additional sponsors that I don't have time to list here this morning, but they're all listed on our website. I want to thank also our President's Council members who are with us today for your support. Now, would you please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Everett Alvarez was a commander in the United States Navy and has the additional distinction of being the longest held prisoner of war in Vietnam. He was in prison for eight and a half years. Welcome. Jack Ench was a captain in the United States Navy and was in prison for nearly one year. Welcome, Jack. Tom Hanton was Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Air Force and was in prison for nearly one year. Welcome, Tom. And Tom McNish was a Colonel in the United States Air Force and was in prison for six and a half years. Welcome.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're already standing, so I'm going to ask you to remain standing and let's honor our country and our flag with the presentation of the colors and the national anthem. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please have a seat. Thank you to our friends at Troy High School and to Alexandra Rupp for that beautiful national anthem. Thank you. Sarah and Ross Perot Jr. made possible a tremendously insightful and professionally produced podcast called Captured, Shot Down in Vietnam, which tells the story of the Vietnam War like you've never heard it before and the experiences of our POWs. And one of those, in fact, who tells their story in the podcast is Everett Alvarez, whom I'm privileged to have gotten to know over the last couple of years. Of course, podcasts are audio mediums. How many listen to podcasts in, in this room? Okay, there you go. Well, I would uh, like to begin this morning by playing about a three-minute trailer of that podcast. Again, it's an audio medium, so uh, there's, there's nothing to see, but I ask you just to sit and listen for a few minutes. During the Vietnam War, hundreds of American aviators were shot down, imprisoned, and tortured for as many as eight long years. If we had no experience in North Vietnam, I was the first guy. United States aircraft 
have resumed action in North Vietnam. I was flying wing on the lead, and it, it, it just started to hit me. Hey, we're going into war. My, my knees started to shake. I couldn't stop them, you know. When I was hit, everything filled up with smoke. Every emergency came on, and I could tell my wings started to come off because I couldn't control it. So I pulled the ejection curtain, and I, and I went out. I felt the chute extend, the parachute extended, popped open, and within two, two three seconds, I was in the water. Exactly 50 years ago, the Nixon administration saved 591 of those prisoners of war from North Vietnamese captivity. The problem of those who were held prisoner in North Vietnam is one of enormous concern to us. We certainly are going to keep this very much high on the agenda and work toward a solution of it in any peace settlement if we can get one. I felt the possibility of being killed was fairly high, but being a prisoner of war, I felt it was very small. My mom meets me at the door and she said, Michael, let's go back to your room. I need, uh, I need to talk to you. And then she told me that he had been shot down over the jungles of North Vietnam and that they were going to go in that afternoon to rescue him. And that was the last word we heard for the next three years. Early 66 is when they started coming the, the physical stuff of these sessions, torture sessions. They wanted to know what targets were coming, and we didn't know. We didn't have what they were asking for. When you heard the guy coming with his keys jangling, especially at night, you knew somebody was going to go out. And you prayed it wasn't you, and if it was you, you just had to face it. Our eventual goal is a total withdrawal of all outside forces. But as long as North Vietnam continues to hold a single American prisoner, we shall have forces in South Vietnam. The American prisoners of war will not be forgotten by their government. This is the premier podcast from the Richard Nixon Presidential Library in partnership with Foundwave Productions, created in honor of Ross Perot Sr., Captured, shot down in Vietnam. So if you want to hear about what it was like to be a prisoner of war, I would encourage you to download that podcast and listen to it. And we put papers, QR codes on all of your seats because we're really not going to get into that very much this morning. Instead, I want to ask these gentlemen uh, some, some other types of questions and begin by asking all of you, and we'll start with Tom down, down on the end. Talk to me about the day that, that you all had on Tuesday when uh, you arrived at the Nixon Library in that beautiful parade. There were 2,000 people out there on your Belinda Boulevard to greet you, yeah, school kids, teenagers. I mean, people that, that you had never met and they had never met you. Uh, they weren't even, like myself, alive during, during the, the Vietnam War uh, era, but they were cheering you on, and all that they've heard is that you are heroes. So I'd, I'd like your reaction to that. Well, I could see, I could see the, the enthusiasm in their faces, and it gave me uh, encouragement that our country is not dead as much as the press likes to make us think. It was very uplifting, to say the least. But I, I'm always encouraged when I see other patriotic Americans, and like all of you in this room. So to me, that's the heart of the country. And to, to experience it again, uh, well, I, I, it took me back 50 years ago because we had similar... Uh, welcomes, not like some of our, uh, our earlier, the, the people that weren't POWs didn't get our treatment. But anyway, it was uplifting and encouraged me. I, like I said, I love being around the patriotic Americans, and I can tell you this part of California is very patriotic. <laughs> and, be, and being a Californian, I'm, I'm happy to be back. Is this live? <laughs> Um, no, I, I'm from California too, Tom, yeah. but it was different back then. Uh, with regard to the parade and the kids, you know what impressed me? Uh, the children. I think that uh, you don't see that around the country. And I, you know, so it was so uplifting to see the, little, the kids out there waving their flags 
it, it just gave you uh, a realization that the heart of America really is like that. Uh, I live outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, I don't go into the district anymore, especially Capitol Hill. It's very frustrating. <laughs> and I'm sure that Governor Wilson can attest to, you know, the atmosphere up there. In, in, and, uh, you know, but I, I pray for my grandchildren, that, you know, because I see what's happening. But then I, I get uplifted when I see the, uh, the young children out here because they're going to remember that the future. Anyway. Thank you, Jack, please. Well, I, uh, I have a bit of a flashback, not to Vietnam, but to my uh, childhood. I was born and raised in the Midwest, uh, central Illinois, and it reminded me of the way America used to be, where your kids, I can remember, at not a prisoner of war, parade, but Fourth uh, of July's and, uh, you know, patriotic times like that when we would make our own little signs and wave our flags and there would be a small parade, you know, and sometimes tractors. <laughs> and <laughs> But uh, it, it a flashback to that and it brought warm, more to my heart to, to feel that again, even for a period, of, short period of time that the parade went along and it took me back to my youth, the way America used to be. Well, from a personal, selfish standpoint, it was just a hell of a lot of fun getting to ride in that beautiful blue 63 Corvette. Oh, yeah. <laughs> on, a more, on a more serious note, I, I, I share what, what the other guys have said about the youth. I actually had fun because one, one guy was brave enough to reach out and slap my hand as we went by. So then every kid for the next 100 yards had their hands out <laughs> and until their t teacher told them to get the hell back on the stage and uh, see my side one. My prayer is that those children will somehow have the opportunity to grow up to appreciate that beautiful flag, the most beautiful piece of cloth on the earth. Um, as I was, hopefully they will learn the truth about the greatness of this country and they, how blessed they are to have been born in the greatest country in the world. Amen. So why don't we start with Tom and uh, Tom McNish, and, and we'll make our way back down. But uh, talk to me, if you would, and talk to our audience about your brotherhood. I mean, the, the, the friendships that, uh, that you all have didn't stop when you left Hanoi. Uh, in fact, you still have reunions all over the country. This is your 50th anniversary reunion since 1973. In this room last night, there were 40 tables. There were 10, 10 or 12 to a table. Uh, it, it, was, it was an amazing uh, experience for those of us that we're, we're blessed to be in, in this room, but talk to me if you would about that brotherhood, what that means, how you furthered you know, these unique relationships that began when you were uh, in, in, in prison, you communicated with tap codes and hand signs, and, and they've become lifelong friendships. Well, the strongest steel is welded and made in the hottest fire, and our friendship was welded by an intense sharing of a extreme, if you will, hot fire of uh, bitterness, evil by the enemy. And uh, particularly those of us who were shot down prior to 68 um, were through our communications became long, or learned to know each other's names and then stories about each other and so forth. And that friendship that, um, that it's, uh, it's, it's more of a brotherhood lasts until today when we're talk, sharing grandkids and I'm blessed to have my first great grandchild here with me. So um, 
you know, it, it's something that it, it's hard to explain to someone who is not, I mean, there are other situations in life where you can, can get that with one or two person, people, but now there are 490 of us left or so, and uh, we're, all, we're all brothers. Well, I'm, I consider myself privileged to be a part of, of this organization. I mean, the, the dues are pretty, uh, joining is uh, pretty steep, but, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I was, I was a, a short time POW, if you will. I was, uh, unlike uh, Ev and Tom here, uh, I had, uh, I was on my fourth combat deployment, 285th mission before they got me. And um, luckily, I missed the 68 and all the festivities you guys went through early. I came, I had my own little bit of hell to go through for a while. They, I came back a little shorthanded, if you will, from the war. The uh, Vietnamese chopped my thumb off. But uh, it, it just, the, the camaraderie, the, the cooperation, the, the um, what I found out was that I found out a lot about myself, about my, my pain tolerance and, and other things, but uh, I also really figured out that you really don't know what you can do and what you can endure until you really have to do it. You can't, you can't say, hey, time out, <laughs> or, you know, let's wait for the second quarter or whatever it is, and we'll come back. When the game starts the day they take, capture you, and the way you survive is by looking to the guy on your left and the guy on the right to support you. And when they get down, he's, on the, he's, he's not having a bad time, and I'm having a good day. I'm getting him up. And some days I'm depressed. He's, hey, hey Kenny, it's not that bad, Jack. Come on, we can do it. It was that kind of, of uh, everybody was in it together certain, some longer, some shorter, but we were all in the same game. And the, the end of the game was to return with honor, and we feel we did that. Well, uh, whether you were there as long as I was, eight and a half years, or whether you were there eight and a half days, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, we're all uh, uh, part of the same group. And uh, my, in my case, uh, I was the uh, uh, first one uh, in the Hanoi Hilton. I was uh, shot down August 5, uh, 1964. But the, the night before, I was participating uh, in <clears throat> flying overhead of two U.S. Navy destroyers that were being attacked by the North Vietnamese torpedo boats at the time, which later became known as the Tonkin Gulf Incident. So that those of you who remember some of the history of that at the time, it was, it was that activity that gave President Johnson and the Congress passed the uh, Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which he could then start to build up the forces uh, in the South. <clears throat> So for many years, I used to, I, uh, I used to say, I started the air war. <laughs> and, and being the first one in uh, the, which we later called the Hanoi Hilton, and then the second fellow came along six months later. And then after that, a lot of the fellows, and then Tom the year following a year, and then many others. And, um, I used to tell them, hey, you know, if, if, you're, if you really wanted a good room, you had to come early. <laughs> so, uh, it didn't always work. <laughs> but uh, Everybody else so, found out what a great time you were having. So yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but the bottom line is that we... We learned early that we had to, to, to stay together, and fortunately, one of the early shoot-downs was a fellow named Smitty Harris who brought in <clears throat> the tap code. Smitty was shot down, I think, a couple of months after uh, 
deal were picked up, like March, April of 65. And uh, he's the one that brought in the tap code that we used to tap on the wall so that we could communicate between cells. And that began uh, the, the period of time which we really relied on this covert communication system because it had to be covert because if you were heard tapping, <clears throat> you had broken the, via the camp commander's rules and, and if you did that, <clears throat> You were severely punished, and uh, you know we won't go into that. But it's you know so it was extremely important, and through that I think we really, really built a strong bond. Like you know, like Tom and Jack just said, it, you know we relied on each other to get us through, and that that reliance is what uh, drove us that. Uh, no, and no matter what we had to face, I think that that, uh, that strong bond and that faith that we had and the, and the knowledge that uh, the United States was not going to forget us uh, <clears throat> kept our spirits alive no matter what. And so the day finally came when we all came home <clears throat> and we've maintained that bond ever since. It's a, um, uh, it's a brotherhood. I could say we... we are part of a brotherhood. And over the years, I think that uh, we've been uh, recognized generously I, as, uh, uh, I think, as models of what, you know, military uh, personnel, military people who fight, you know, should be. And I think that uh, we can take pride in that. But let me tell you, it's these guys that uh, did the job, especially the 52s that came down at the end of the war, like uh, uh, the late shoot downs, they, uh, they are the ones that uh, did, made the difference. And, and uh, Nixon, President Nixon had the courage to do that, but that's what got us home. Well, as Ev said, uh, the military is a brotherhood, and for any of us who have been in combat, that type of intensity uh, strengthens those bonds, and we, we didn't fail to continue our fight when we were in the prison camp. We just had a different weapon, which was our minds, primarily, and as Ev alluded to, the TAP code to staying uh, in, uh, tied together through that process, even when one was in solitary confinement. Fortunately, I spent a very short time period in solitary, and I didn't have to use the TAP code, but what we used was a, a flash code, a modified uh, mute code. Um, as I said, the, the intensity of the prison camps is what really drove our bond together, and as, uh, as was told by, uh, you heard it on the podcast, what President Nixon said, Jack and I, being late shoot downs, had the opportunity to know what was going on with our foreign policy that Nixon was executing through war, uh, intensifying the war when the, when the North Vietnamese uh, came across the border in 72. When I was at Da Nang, about a 10 minute flight in an F-4, from the DMZ, we knew what was going on. So even in solitary, we knew that we weren't going to be abandoned. Uh, these guys got no news, and the news they got was bad news. Kind of like CNN today. I'm, I mean, so I don't mean to get political. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I, I don't mean to. Be, I'm serious. I'm, I want to be here uplifting. I don't want to be negative about things. But that's the kind of news these guys would get. Everything that was bad news in the U.S. was, was we knew that we were not going to be abandoned. And I think these guys, when we made contact with them and we were able to pass on some of the information on what was happening. Uh, and I, I knew that if Ev Alvarez, and he was known, we were uh, in our search, let's see, what's it called? It was our 
survival training. We were well aware of the conditions. Some of the people had come home early. Uh, Hegdahl, who was a Navy seaman, you may not know that story, he was washed ashore off the ship, and he came home early and uh, was able to report to the government, the military, uh, what the conditions were like. So my training was quite good on how to resist and what to expect. And uh, so my, I was educated that I knew what to, what to do, uh, and they weren't torturing us. Uh, I had 135 missions in about five months. Um, it was very intense in 72, and, uh, but I was thankful for the B-52s, something we could have done in years before, earlier. Uh, that is one thing that the interrogators, and I, they were still there in 72, and they, they, would, they came to us afterwards in our, the camp I was in, it was a zoo asking what was going on, and uh, we told them, Nixon's bringing us home. And of course, I, they didn't like that answer, and the, the rabbit who was in our camp of course, stomped away and came back and dug his bomb shelter right in the back of the zoo, pigsty. <laughs> mm. Anyway, these are my brothers. I'd go anywhere with them, and I know they'd go anywhere with, with me. And it's an honor to be with them. Yesterday, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the uh, White House dinner in your honor. And I just want to paint the picture for, for the audience and for all those that are listening and watching online. But this remains the largest dinner in the history of the White House in honor of these men. There were 1,300 people. Uh, it's too big, too many to fit in the White House, so they had to do it outside. They did it on the South Lawn in a giant tent, a colorful tent that had actually been borrowed from a circus. Uh, and it, and the, the, uh, there were so many, there were so many people that they uh, chilled the champagne in large canoes and placed them all around. Uh, there were celebrities at many of the tables. So I, I, I want to ask you about the dinner, your top memories from the White House dinner. Who did you sit with? Uh, what, what are your memories? And I want to start with Everett because uh, I, I believe you sat with John Wayne. Uh, I did. <laughs> okay, Pilgrim. Yeah, it's... Uh... I mean, there he was, <laughs> right across from me. Big. Yeah, my, uh, you know, my icon, I see, growing up, and, or, and so it was awesome. And you mentioned earlier, uh, Jim, that last night's uh, replication, replication of, the, of the event was in this room. It didn't look like this last night. No, no. I mean, it was beautiful, it still is. But it was just laid up. You know, everything was so exquisite. And uh, of course, there's so many, so many memories. It's still like a daze of, of uh, that evening and those days. But besides uh, sitting with John Wayne and other movie stars, and uh, Henry Kissinger was on the tab table next to us, and next to him was uh, <clears throat> a, one of the fellows' dates. Uh, she had been the Playboy Bunny of the year. All right. So uh, I, I have to admit, my eyes wandered over in that. that. <laughs> but I also noticed that Henry's eyes were wandering <laughs> over. And, uh, and, and, and to cap it off, uh, <clears throat> uh, this was my wife's, my wife and I, this was our first date at the White House dinner. And uh, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary later on this year. Tom, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it was one of those, we had so many monumental events uh, in 72 that many countries, in fact, I was a California resident and Ronald Reagan was the governor, and my wife was in Sacramento with our young child that was born while I was MIA. Uh, so one of the events was at the uh, governor's mansion there in Sacramento at Reagan's. Uh, and then about, I don't know how long, much longer, 
the time was before we went to the White House. And of course, you, you can't compare the governor's mansion of California with the White House, but it was the same feeling of wonderment. I was, I'd never been uh, that close to, to politicians before. And, and, and meeting, meeting President Nixon, shaking each of our hands, uh, it was just, uh, I was almost, uh, I don't want to say in shock, but I don't have some of the memories that some of my friends do. I don't know. It was, it was just, I was taking it all in or, or I just wasn't uh, aware. I don't have the specific, I don't remember who was at our table. And Tom, you asking the question of the table range, I'd like to see that, to, to see who I was sitting with, because I don't know. It wasn't John Wayne, who was also an icon, uh, Ev. It was one of the, one of, probably a congressman or, or, or one, of the, one of the folks. Was, they, I think they... Rightfully so, I had people seated by a shoot-down date, so I, I was probably towards the back of the room somewhere, which was fine. They were all good seats. They were certainly better than some of the seats we had over in Hanoi. But <laughs> it was, this, this event last night, certainly, and the way you orchestrated it and choreographed with some of the videos, that was exceptional. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yep. I, I, you were, I, have, I, have, I don't remember either who was sit, exactly sitting at my table, but some, my, my memories of that, I met John Wayne uh, there, you know, and shook hands with him, and it was like putting your hand in a little coal bucket. My God, a <laughs> huge man. But one of the things that I finally remember, it would be unprecedented, it would never happen again, I'm sure, in the White House, but they gave us free reign to walk around, look at the White House, you know, and uh, myself, Bill Spencer, uh, two or three of my other, my cohorts and cellmates, we were there. The wives were downstairs, and we walked up the stairs. We walked, we had the free, we walked in, I sat on the uh, Lincoln bedroom <laughs> table. Uh, yeah, it's not bad. And, uh, so we, we were looking around, and we started to go back down the stairs. And of course, naval aviators, you know, when you walk in someplace, you think you own it, you know. <laughs> he goes, and we walk walking back down the passageway, and there's this door over here, and it's closed. And one of us said, "What, what do you suppose is in there?" I don't know. Yeah, let's look. <laughs> Open the door, and it was President Nixon's study, and he was sitting behind the desk. His had his uh, tuxedo um, coat hanging on the back of a chair over there, and he was sitting behind the desk, and he was doing something, I don't know, uh, maybe working on a speech that he was going to be giving that night, you know, and then here's the four, three or four of us, we look in there, you know, we're standing there. <laughs> and we said, I can remember uh, thinking to myself, holy crap, what, <laughs> what have we done? We said, oh, Mr. President, we're sorry, he said, it's all right, boys. Just go on downstairs, and I'll be there in a little while. <laughs> That's my memory. And we know we we got the hell out of there. <laughs> on downstairs, looking around, we were figured that we'd be the Secret Service would have us in cuffs and get the hell out of there, but. I mean, he was just as gracious as could be, you know, just, oh, man, boys, well, I'll be down later. And that's a memory that I have of that night. Well, that night was just particularly special to me, not for who I sat with, except that it was the young lady that uh, came to that dinner with me as my girlfriend her title changed that night. Um, after the dinner was over, we all went back into the East Room to uh, dance. And, and about, I don't know, maybe, I think about 11.30, President Nixon came out and said, you know, Pat and I are going to bed. You, you guys have full reign of the White House everywhere except our bedroom. <laughs> and the bartenders will keep pouring and the band will keep playing until the last one of you leaves. 
Well, about 2 o'clock in the morning. Some guys, it was daylight when they left, trust me. Um, about 2 o'clock in the morning, my, my girlfriend and I decided we would take advantage of that opportunity, and we started wandering through the White House. And uh, we got to the, to the green room in front of the fireplace, and I did the smartest damn thing I ever did in my life. Spontaneously, unplanned, totally, I asked her to marry me. And her first answer was, are you sure? <laughs> and then she said yes. Um, so we have been very blessed. Uh, uh, in October, in August of that year, we were married. So we're looking for 50 years this August. And uh, our whole family of uh, all but three of our grandkids are here. So we've got 15 of our family here with us. And I love that those young kids are getting exposed to this environment. So two 50th wedding anniversaries. So ha happy anniversary to the, to the yep. two of you. I want to ask a question about, uh, about mental health because it's an important issue in, in our country today. And you know, I would say PTSD is recognized and, and destigmatized, I think, now in a way that it certainly wasn't 50 years ago. Um, Everett, you shared with me on Sunday that many in the military thought that the repatriated POWs would have to go into mental institutions right after you had come home. And of course, by and large, that didn't happen. Uh, what guidance would you share with your fellow service members today who may be suffering from, from PTSD? Maybe we'll start, start with Tom. Well, I, I've got perhaps a little more of a, of a scientific background to answer that question because I was blessed when I came home that the Air Force supported my desires to become a doctor. And so when I, after I came home, I uh, immediately entered a year of pre-med, four years of med school, three years of a residency in family practice, and two of a residency in aerospace medicine. So after 10 years, they decided to put me back to work. Um, uh, your, your, your question about PTSD, I think, to put in context from us, and this helps give a good context for it, I think. Our rate of PTSD amongst the returned POWs was probably the lowest of any group from the Vietnam War. Um, I blame that on a couple of things. I, I, I attribute it to a couple of things, is probably the right way. One was particularly for those of us who were shot down Pre-68, as you know, there was a four-year bombing halt. Um, we had been there long enough that we had incorporated that, spirit, that experience into uh, uh, just a, a part of our lives, a part of who we was. I think Jack says it beautifully, he says it was a part of our lives, it wasn't the end of our lives. Um, but. Um, as a result, we've had less than a, like a 10% rate of PTSD among the POWs. The contrast to that is the way the Vietnam veterans who served in the South, who were shot at, so they saw their buddies killed next to them, walked through mud, had, had to fight with punji stakes and everything else, served their country just as honorably as we did. And they came home to an ungrateful nation. They, they were afraid to wear their uniforms. They were spit on, called baby killers. And as you might expect in that group, the, 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 the rate of PTSD was much higher. Um, to those of you who are Vietnam veterans in this room, the first thing I want to say to you is welcome home. 
Yeah. Been a long damn time coming. We came home, we had no idea when we left the prison camp how we were going to be treated. Were we just going to be put back to work and, or were we going to be kicked out of the military because we lost an airplane or, or whatever. Um, but when we flew from Hanoi to Clark in the Philippines, our first stop, the, the, peop, the, the flight attendants on the airplane said, you know, you're going to be surprised at what you see. And I said, yeah, okay. And we got off that airplane, and there were hundreds of people there with flags and signs, welcome home, a hero, all that stuff. None of us consider ourselves heroes. We did. We had a different job description for a period of time, and we tried to do it well. But that doesn't make us, make us heroes. Um, if we have done anything to improve the love of America and the understanding of America, then that's, that's our, our true, the value that we have. But uh, as far as PTSD treatment, the VA is developing, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of um, more advanced therapies developed and it is, it is very treatable for 99% of the cases. And the, the main thing is to, is to believe that you can beat it. It's, um, and there are ways to help and to facilitate, a, advise as to how to do that. But uh, if you can, those who suffer from PTSD, God bless them. But trust, but you've got to believe that you can beat it. It's kind of like we were in jail and we knew that our country was never going to forget us and we were going to beat those little rascals. We were going to fight them in a different way. We were fighting a different battle but we were still fighting the enemy to take away their ability to use us in any way against our country. Yeah. Well, uh, being a naval aviator, we were used to being called nuts because flying on and off of aircraft carriers a day and night and everything, but uh, I, I had a few, uh, few little bumps and everything that had to be repaired when I got back. But uh, like Tom said, people ask me about that, and I agree with what he says about the hero stuff. I, but I said that oftentimes I said it was a part of my life, it wasn't the end of my life. My life didn't end just because I was a POW. I came back and I fought hard to get back on active duty, back on flight status, so I could go back and I had a successful Navy career, 30 years, had my own fighter squadron later on and a couple of other commands. But uh, so it's, I know it's cliche to say, but it was kind of like, you know, uh, they say about getting thrown from a horse, best thing you can do is get the hell back up and get on that horse. And that's the way I looked at it. So I got back into the flying staff. That's what I want, that's why I joined the Navy to do. And I had a little hiatus there, uh, unaccompanied shore duty in uh, Hanoi. And, uh, but I wanted to get back and fly it. And so, uh, like I said, uh, wasn't the end of my life. I had a successful career. Three beautiful daughters, five grandkids, and as of last month, a great grandfather. <laughs> so those accomplishments are a hell of a lot more than just my individual compliments as a POW, a MIG killer, a, and a naval officer and all that stuff. Family, that's the important thing. And that's what we need to get back to in this country, is families. Families. <laughs> families built this country. Families kept this country going. And if we don't get back to the mothers and fathers paying attention to what they hook their kids are doing, and get them off these damn machines <laughs> and get back to the family values, then that's what worries me the most. Okay. 
You know, I, I, I just, I mean, everything that they have said, I, I was, that's part of what I would, I would have said. Of course, Tom, with his medical background, is a deeper, a deeper thing. Um, I, I just have to tell you that uh, I often wondered after we got home when, over the years why, you know, when I learned about PTSD and what have you, <clears throat> is, well, what's wrong with me? Because I felt okay until people asked me, oh, you know, are you okay? <laughs> and, and, you know, after a while, you begin to wonder. <laughs> and so a number of years ago, uh, there was a fellow who wanted to do a documentary, <clears throat> and he was going to take some people back, and he wanted to film uh, us in the Hanoi Hilton because the Vietnamese government was going to tear it down because <coughs> the Hanoi Hilton gave, North, gave Vietnam a black eye in world public opinion, so they were going to wipe it out. So before that, you know, he, he asked if I would go. And I said, no, and he said, so he asked again, came back, and finally after about four or five times, you know, he got my curiosity up. And so um, um, I finally said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll go, because I always thought if I was going to take a week off, I'd rather go to the beach with my kids, my family. The kids were small and Disney World and stuff like that. But anyway, I said, okay, I'll go. And that's when I started getting, when people found out that I was going to go back. Well, they said, aren't you, uh, aren't you concerned? I mean, are they taking medical people with you, like a, 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 a nurses to what? And I said, what for? He, they said, well, you're going to have so many emotional ups and downs. And I, I said, really? Anyway, <laughs> so before I left, you know, John McCain was in, in Congress, so, and he had just gone to Vietnam with Walter Cronkite on, a, on a first, one of the first visits back, and this was before normalization. And so I, got, so I called John, I said, hey, look, I'm, I'm going back uh, with this crew, and there were five, of other, five other guys. And <clears throat> I said, John, did you have any problems? And of course, John being John, he said, oh, God, Ev, don't listen to that stuff. Just go, have a good time. And then he says, stay at this hotel, and here's a couple of bars you want to go visit. <laughs> and, go, and, and he says, go, go, go to the lake where I was, they have a statue of me in this lake. And I said, but just go. So I did. And uh, a long story short, I got back, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to, uh, you know, we had no doctors, no nurses, nobody. And they went into my, into the old cells, and of course the camera was right here, you know, ready to record all this emotional stuff. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it just bothered me that this guy, you know, this camera. Anyway, after that, I, I, I sat down, I figured, you know, there's something Maybe there is something wrong, because I had no reaction whatsoever, and no emotional reaction. And then as I'm sitting there, and I'm looking around, you know, one of the treatments that uh, and, and Tom's was, is that when they, we set up, and I was with the, uh, I worked with the Reagan administration, and I was the uh, num number two at the VA and, and acting head of the VA for, for a couple of times. But one of the things we did is that we uh, put in place a lot of these storefront walk-in Vietnam veteran centers, and you guys may remember some of these things. And one of the most popular things that they walked in would be the, the rap sessions, because the Vietnam veterans would talk about their experience with each other. And so they would go in there and they would unload and tell their stories, but they couldn't talk to the rest of the people out here. And it hit me. You know, maybe one of, one of the reasons why we had such a low rate, like Tom just said, is because in our, in our cells, 
we sat there all day and tapped. And we communicated. And we had our own rap sessions all the time. And when they had tough times and you come back after having been out for a couple of days and they're working on you and maybe you gave in and this and that. I mean, nobody was a Superman. You came in and you unloaded everything and we shared everything. So in a way, I think that that had a large effect on the reason that we came back uh, with such a low PTSD rate. I, I agree. I don't want to say it, but, but I, yeah. again, <clears throat> what, when we came back, you know, we got this, as you described, this huge welcome at home and, and what have you. But the, you fellas that served, you, you know, you, either you, you were drafted or you volunteered, you went over there, you gave a couple of years, a year of your life, then you came back, uh, you served. And to be treated the way a lot of you were was just not fair. And so I, I think that that's probably one of the biggest lessons that we learned as a country from Vietnam was that you don't blame you folks, uh, men and women who are carrying out our country's policies. If you have a complaint, uh, take it up to Capitol Hill. I call it limbo, because everything that goes in there just disappears. <laughs> so, but that's, that's my, worry. oh, by the way, <clears throat> Tom mentioned family being, and, and Jack, me and family, most important. Uh, our kids have gotten to know each other pretty well. So uh, <clears throat> our other son couldn't bring his family, but our youngest son, brought his family, and uh, the, my grandson is here. He's nine years, nine months old. <clears throat> He's having a good time, <laughs> if I can tell. Boy, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> I can't add, add anything globally, but on a personal basis, uh, I think how I avoided, it was probably my upbringing. My dad, my father was a fighter pilot, career fighter pilot in the Air Force, so we moved around a lot which meant I went to a lot of schools. So I got used to change and being not necessarily the in crowd all the time, because as you all know, it takes a while to, to get inculcated, and then you, your dad, you get moved again. So I was kind of used to being jacked around, if you will, which is what they did in Vietnam. And uh, the communication part, you know, you, you have friends and buddies and stuff. So on a personal basis, I just, I kind of acted like I was in school again and meeting new people and, uh, being the worst nightmare I could be to the guards for my own sanity, <coughs> pranks and things like that. I'm kind of known for that. And I was either the teacher's pet or the worst nightmare. And the good nuns would, I've got, I used to rap on the hands, you know, there was nothing wrong with being spanked and things like that. And that's, I grew up that way. So it was not beatings. I'm not advocating beating children, uh, I'm, but we, that's what, the way I grew up. Uh, so I don't think that the suffering for me personally was, it was different, of course, obviously. Being in a prison camp is a little different than, than being in school, but uh, I just, I, on a personal basis, learned to, to take one day at a time, and uh, I'm still that way. It, it's, so I, I'm sure I have some PTSD. I don't think it's impossible to avoid it. If it is, it's mild. I've never had any nightmares or woke up in the middle of the night uh, thinking I'm, uh, you know, back in jail or anything. Um, and our combat is a lot different in the Air Force than it is for the land guys. And every time I see movies uh, or any film clips of the guys slogging it through the jungle, I shake my head. I have also had an experience of going back to Hanoi and going to the Hilton. It wasn't full up. They'd already torn it down and left. It's a museum now, for those of you who are unaware. And I had the... Uh, some people think it's a misfortune. I thought it was a, an interesting experience of meeting the uh, MiG-21 pilot who shot me down. Mm -hmm. And you'd say, how in the world could you ever go meet a person who was trying to kill you? Well, he wasn't trying to kill me. He was trying to prevent my airplane from you know, doing what it's supposed to do in North Vietnam. Uh, I could spend a day here talking to you about the experience in North Vietnam. And 
I know the Vietnamese people in, in, in our community now probably have a different, uh, perhaps a different uh, thought about, about their country. Uh, but uh, the Vietnamese I know here are the hardest working people I think I've ever seen. Uh, we had a great big community. When I lived in Falls Church my 15 years back in the D.C. area. Uh, the community there was quite strong, and I got involved with several of the uh, uh, community pol political events there, so I, I got to appreciate what they were doing for the community. And wanting to be Americans, you know, well, people come to this country and want to be Americans, that's why you should come here. And there's, there's nothing wrong with your culture and maintaining the culture, but becoming strong Americans is what, you're, what we're here to do. And uh, Anyway, I don't feel like I had any any strong regrets of going to back to Vietnam. It's a beautiful country, uh, and I go back again. It's changed. Obviously, we we were not allowed off the base at Da Nang when I was there in '72, mainly for our safety, not necessarily. Plus, there wasn't a lot to do at downtown Da Nang that I remember. I went through it once in a in a vehicle, but I don't I don't remember much about the country and that that area of it. Anyway, I'm rambling, and I I, I apologize for that, but. Uh, Having a strong brotherhood has, I think, prevented it. It's a, f a different kind of family that you mentioned, or Jack, or Tom, or one of you guys. Well, I could keep talking to you guys all day, but uh, unfortunately, we only have time for one last question. Um, I want to ask all of you to talk a little bit about what drove you in the prison camps to keep pushing through. And Tom McNish, you said in an interview on Tuesday that it was that your country and you just said it again, that your country would not lose faith in you, and, and, and that that was one of the things that drove you. Um, what else drove you? What, what helped you to get through that hellish experience? I kind of like to break it down into, into three things that I think were major. Um, first, you might guess, is, is, is faith. Both. But I break faith down into three things, faith in my country, faith in my God, and faith in my fellow prisoners. And the faith in my fellow prisoners was never once challenged. Um, I, I, I could always count on them. Um, if I came back from a torture session, just barely able to tap on the wall, the first thing I did was was communicate to them, and all of us did this, that uh, exactly what the latest torture question was, you know. So uh, that faith in my fellow prisoners was key, but also more so than that was the faith in my country. I absolutely, I was eternal optimist. I was never more than six months from going home. You know, I had to revise that at least 11 times. But... Uh, but I was right, I, I did come home, and the guys that believed they were gonna die there didn't. So, um, being right counts. I, the faith in our, in our country is key, and it's key to, to a, a, for a more important thing than you might think, that just the fullest possible accounting of MIAs, we need to get them back, we need to find out for their families. Think of it in a, in a second level, folks. If we cannot stand up and tell these young folks that we see in uniform today that you will never be forgotten by your country. If you go missing, your country will do everything that is humanly possible to get you back. That faith was one of the key things that got me through. And if we can't say that to the young folks today, how can we expect them to have the relatively successful experience in a captivity environment that we did. So now, for every chance you get, please push for fullest possible accounting of all of our MIAs. And, and every chance you get, make sure that the young folks understand that, that they will not be forgotten. Now, the, the other things that, uh, that I counted on was our, our ingenuity 
And that got us through, uh, you've already heard discussions of the TAP code. Well, that was an ingenious thing that was brought in and it allowed us to communicate. Um, but the ingenuity comes into using the TAP code, not just to TAP. If you can cough, you can cough in TAP code. And the Vietnamese just think you got a bad cold. Um, if you go out to sweep the porch, you can sweep the porch in TAP code and communicate to the whole camp. Uh, break rocks, same thing. Uh, if you've got a little bit of light space that you can close and open to someone that can see it, you can flash in TAP code. Um, and then later we got into a situation where people were coming in who didn't know the TAP code and there was no way to get to them except that we were able to see them. Um, actually, my, my roommate, Mike Brazelton, was able to stand up. He was 130 pounds, and I was about 180, so he stood on my shoulders uh, to get up to this hole in the wall that the Vietnamese had left out, and we could, through it we could see some new prisoners. Well, we started trying to flash tap code, and that didn't work because they had no idea. And uh, so overnight, I came up with 26 different things to do with your hand to, to be an alphabet. Not the deaf mute code, I knew the deaf mute code it existed, but even had I remembered it, it probably would not have helped because some of the letters are so close together that you can't re distinguish them from a distance. But anyway, 26 different things to do with your hand. The next day, he's up there looking through the hole, gets their attention, and uh, he goes, starts going through these things with his hand, and they realize, oh, yeah, that, that's 26. Oh, that's an alphabet. And by the next day, we were communicating freely to them. One of the first things we taught them was the alphabet. And the other was the important thing that uh, Colonel uh, Robbie Reisner, who was a senior Air Force person at that time, had put out, which was uh, when you're tortured, Hold out as long as you can until you think there's a probability of permanent mental or physical damage. And then give them just enough to get them off your back so that you can have a chance to get your strength back. And then the key word came in and then you can re-resist. Just because we were broken once didn't mean we were broken forever. They had to work just as hard the second and third time to get something out of you as they did the first. And uh, I think that that that, w that was like uh, 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 the sky opening up for me, who I was very depressed that I had given a lot more stuff than I wanted to. And when I got that information, uh, that was that was a real, real blessing. So anyway, uh, that's, that's, that's kind of where we're, were the things that, that I think that, that actually enabled me to feel that I, along with my brothers, came home with their honor intact. Well, I agree with that. The, the faith, I think, is, to me, it was faith in God, faith in my country, faith in my family. Um, also, I was a born and raised Catholic boy, St. Cathedral Boys High School, I mean, Cathedral Boys High School. St. Patrick's Gray School. I took an oath when I came to join the Navy, and so um, I felt that when you take an oath, you're supposed to live up to it. So I, uh, but the faith uh, uh, in God, I, I said a lot of prayers. When I first got shot down, I was very badly injured. The, the thumb was badly mangled, and I had two L uh, dislocated elbow, so I, I was no threat coming down to North Vietnam, that's for sure. But uh, they let me lay for three days using my wounds against me until they could get me to say more than name, rank, silver, number, and date of birth. And during that time, I had a, a lot of meetings with myself, if you will. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure the Lord probably put me on, on message because he was tired of listening to me, to, you know, hey, I need, I need some help here. But I said a lot of prayers, and I, I thought a lot of, uh, you know. But that, but the faith, and as Thomas said, you know, that that's, I believed that my country was going to come get me. I was a short timer. I knew that. I knew the war was probably going to end. 
and I had the faith that my family would be there when I got home, my wife and three, t three daughters. And, uh, and I also had the faith once I got in with the rest of the POWs after they had given me my uh, early Obamacare. Um, they uh, <clears throat> took care of me, and once I got in with the other POWs, what did they do? They took care of me. They nursed me back to health from the things that I, my, my wounds and everything like that. So the faith was, to me, uh, one of the things that got me through it. Faith in God, faith in the country, and faith in my family. Well, er everything that Tom said and uh, everything that Jack said applies to, to me, too. And uh, it's just, uh, <clears throat> you know, it was just important to keep, our, keep each other going. That, uh, that was key. And, and the different means of communication that uh, Tom mentioned, uh, the different methods and, and the hand, uh, finger, code that you guys came up, came up with uh, was extremely effective to keep ourselves going day to day, especially during the rough years. Being the first one there, I was totally alone for six months, and then uh, the next fellow was shot down. And, but we st they still kept us separate, and I really didn't see my first American or talk to another American uh, for a total of 13 months. Uh, and, and it was hard, I have to admit. It was not easy. But you know what? I, I, um, I grew up uh, in, uh, in a community that I had. Uh, I was Catholic. I was an altar boy. And a lot of that came back. And uh, I learned that I had a lot of conversations, as I told my grand, one of my grandsons. I used to have a lot of conversations with a man upstairs every day. And, uh, and I found that that was extremely important for me. Uh, and that continued as these fellows came along and we got into other, other means of supporting each other, what have I still kept up that conversation. And I remember each... Uh, each night when we crawl under our mosquito nets and, you know, lights out, or the nights never went out, but it was sort of, you know, time to, time to go to bed. And I would, uh, you know, I would, thank the, I would thank God that, I, you know, another day had gone by, I'm still here. Of course, you know, you, remember you tucked the mosquito net under your mat. That kept the rats out from crawling in and nibbling on your toes, I, you know, you mentioned that, or if some of the camps, you know, other rodents and snakes that would make their way into your cells, um, night visitors. So there was a little sense of security there. <clears throat> um, I had a, I had a, I, about a year ago, I was uh, speaking to a, a graduating class of uh, a graduate medical education uh, people. And, you know, and, and they, people come up and want to take their pictures and talk and everything. But I remember a, uh, I don't know where this woman appears, and this lady says, I bet you talk to Jesus. And without blinking an eye, I said, every day. And uh, so for me, that was, that was a, a key, the key. Amongst what, you know, as the other, other guys explained here. I've said, I have the same experiences. Uh, I was a Catholic boy, uh, altar boy as well. And uh, I, I'm a person of routine and organization, so I always had to have something to do every day. And I had, first thing I would do is prayers, self to myself, until we started our own, uh, on Sunday, church services. Yeah. And then some exercises, push-ups, sit-ups, and, uh, and uh, 
I didn't, couldn't do chin-ups, so it was just sit-ups and push-ups, things like that before they would let us out. But humor was a big thing uh, to, uh, to stay upbeat, positive. I'm a half glass is full person, not a, the other way around. And I mentioned earlier the pranks. I, I could go through all these various things we would pull on the guards that <laughs> it was humorous. We laughed. Uh, I knew they weren't going to beat us up or took, put us in the ropes. If you guys had done some of these things, I know what would happen. But you heard Nixon's words in the podcast. I knew those things that, that he had stated we were going to be coming home. So I didn't lose faith in the time I'd be there. And it was one day at a time. Just take one day at a time and be patient. We will get home. And like I say, I knew if Ev and you guys had been there five, six, and seven years, we could do it. Uh, they were an inspiration. Many of their stories came through in our uh, survival training. They were the 76 percenters. 76 percent of the, of the POWs that were shot down over North Vietnam were shot down between 64 and 68. 24 percent of us were shot down in 1972. So uh, I, I like to consider that description when I talk about the, these old guys. We're all old now. It's just a matter of a few years older. Yeah, well, we had, uh, as the years went by, we started uh, classifying the guys. So the guys that were the first few years, they, you were a yeah, uh, old guy. And uh, after that, you were a new guy. But, with the, so, but we used to call them, the old guys were the fogs. And the new guys were the FNGs. And that, I think, was a... You, you can fill in the words if you want to. <laughs> One last thing, it was the communication, and they talked about, this, about the, ta the tap code and the flag code. G, B, U. God bless you. Gentlemen, thank you for allowing the Nixon Foundation to celebrate this golden anniversary with you. And ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in thanking our POWs.